a lost Neanderthal skullcap and a rediscovered arm bone could solve a long-standing mystery of their migrations. In the spring of 1927, along the right bank of the Volga River near the town of Kvalinsk, a fragmentary human skull and a humerus were recovered during geological work. The site, Koroshkovsky Island, stood in a landscape shaped by ancient river channels, sandy terraces and changing shorelines. At the time, the bone finds attracted curiosity but not alarm. Such fragments were sometimes picked up incidentally and placed into academic collections. They were transferred to the Geological Museum associated with the Moscow academic community, eventually becoming part of the broader Pavlov collection, named for the geologist who amassed numerous paleontological and anthropological specimens from the Middle Volga. Early researchers briefly noted that the skull showed archaic features. Then the specimens disappeared into storage. For decades, nothing more happened. The skull fragment was cited only second-hand in mid-century anthropological literature. Its morphology was described as Neanderthaloid by Soviet specialists and was occasionally referenced in surveys of quaternary paleontology of the Volga. Thereafter, it vanished. Whether it was misplaced, borrowed, misfiled, or transferred privately has never been resolved. The humerus, however, survived. During a recent routine review of osteological holdings at the Vernadsky Geological Museum, curators recognized a fossilized human humerus among drawers of unstudied bones. A faded note pinned to it stated that it had been found in 1927, nearly 100 years ago, on Koroshkovsky Island near Kvalinsk, and that it was recovered alongside a skull. The accompanying note contained a detail at once thrilling and devastating. It read simply, Fragment of human cranium and humerus found in 1927. Cranium missing. The rediscovery sparked immediate work, because advances in imaging, microanatomy and comparative metrics made it possible to describe anatomy invisible to earlier workers. The humerus was extraordinarily robust. Its shaft was strongly flattened in the medialateral dimension, revealing an ellipsoid cross-section not typical of modern humans. The bone cortex was extremely thick, with hypertrophy at the attachment regions of the deltoid and pectoralis muscles. The marks of powerful upper limb use rose from the bone surface in irregular ridges, so pronounced that in life they would have anchored muscle masses uncommon even among Neanderthals. A groove separating muscular crests evoked the sort of repetitive loading described in Neanderthal arms at classic sites in France and elsewhere, though in this case the development was even more extreme. The shaft suggested a right arm accustomed to repetitive forceful actions, most likely thrusting or spear use against powerful prey. He was even dubbed the Popeye Neanderthal for his huge arm bones, which were even bent from extreme strength. More surprising still was the internal microstructure. Histological study demonstrated cortical deposition patterns that diverged from both anatomically modern humans and from other Neanderthals. The investigators interpreted these features to indicate an unusual, even pathological, hormonal profile. In modern physiology, comparable patterns do not align neatly with known pathologies. Instead, the Volga Neanderthal specimen suggested a condition outside known physiological norms, in which hormones regulating growth and muscle architecture operated at an atypical setting. Since the bone belonged to an adult, the pattern likely reflects long-term systemic biology rather than transient illness. It may represent an adaptive profile, either genetically transmitted or environmentally stimulated by cold stress and energy demands. Although the humerus cannot yield a direct date, its morphology and the geological setting indicate considerable antiquity. The geological and paleontological context described for the site encompasses a broad span from the late Acheulean to the early Upper Paleolithic, bridging roughly 130,000 to 190,000 years ago. Morphology, however, places the individual closer to the earlier part of that range. Neanderthals with such robusticity and archaic proportions are characteristic of middle Pleistocene populations, likely between about 130 and 190,000 years before present. The age range aligns well with known Neanderthal activity in the wider region, including the Caucasus, the Urals and the Altai, 
where remains show presence around 100,000 to 140,000 years ago, and where Denisovan occupation reaches still deeper antiquity. The context becomes more intriguing when a broader geographic frame is considered. In 2025, mitochondrial DNA extracted from a Neanderthal bone fragment from Staroselli in Crimea lustered closely with the mitochondrial lineages of Neanderthals from the Altai. The study concluded that late Neanderthals in Crimea likely descended, at least in part, from populations that moved out of Siberia along an ecological corridor around 55 degrees north latitude. That same latitudinal band runs straight through the middle Volga, implying that the Kvalinsk region lay on a major Neanderthal transit route. The humeral fragment predates the Crimean Neanderthal by many tens of millennia, yet its presence fits comfortably within a pattern of eastern Neanderthal mobility. The Volga, therefore, may have functioned as a natural highway connecting western Eurasia to the Altai long before the final glacial episode. The lost skull fragment might have provided decisive morphological confirmation of this population's affinities. Several descriptions emphasized archaic contours and a thickness of the vault consistent with robust Neanderthals. Without it, the evidence hangs disproportionately on the humerus. Yet the proximity of skull and arm at discovery, only two meters apart, makes it virtually certain that they belong to the same individual. The scribbled note acknowledging the missing Calvaria underscores its earlier physical presence in the museum. Its subsequent disappearance prevents genetic testing today. Taken together, the Kvalinsk humerus and the vanished Calvaria suggest an individual shaped by both ancestry and climate. The Middle Volga region during the Middle Pleistocene was a dynamic ecological boundary. Steppe, river valley, and intermittent forest created a mosaic of habitats that moved north and south with changing glacial pulses. This shifting frontier likely funneled large grazing animals along predictable paths, drawing hunters who could intercept bison, horse, and woolly rhinoceros. Such activity required immense strength, skill, and coordinated group action. Cold stress, repeated mechanical loading, and high-calorie diets heavy in animal protein would have acted together on bone, carving powerful muscle attachments and thickening cortical bone. Yet the Kvalinsk specimen exceeded even these expectations, pressing into a domain where anatomical stress gives way to endocrine influence. The possibility that his physiology reflects deeper genetic ancestry raises the question of Denisovan ties. The Denisovans represent a sister population to Neanderthals with a hybrid presence in the Altai. Their known remains are limited, but their genetic legacy indicates that they adapted to severe cold and environmental extremes. The shared distribution of Denisovans and Neanderthals in the Altai, the presence of recurrent Neanderthal-Denisovan hybridization, and the subsequent dispersal of Neanderthal mitochondrial lineages westward offer the possibility that eastern Neanderthals carried Denisovan influence along the same ecological band that later delivered Altai mitochondria to Crimea. Although there is no evidence, the Kvalinsk Neanderthal may have had the rare rhesus blood type, known as partial RHD type 4, found in the Altai Neanderthals. The Kvalinsk Neanderthal, positioned geographically and temporally between these regions, could represent a remnant of that interaction. His unusual hormonal signature might, conceivably, reflect heritable traits rooted in a shared ancestral population accustomed to high-latitude environments. Neanderthals at Denisova Cave include Denisova 5, Denisova 15, and Denisova 9, all dating to the same period as the Kvalinsk Neanderthal. Confusingly, they are labelled as Denisova because they come from Denisova Cave, but genetically, they are Neanderthal. Although the absence of the skullcap prevents genomic testing, the humerus alone situates the Volga Neanderthal within this east-west dialogue. His limb proportions, the flattened cross-section, and the enhanced muscle markings align with Neanderthal adaptations for powerful thrusting and close-range hunting. The thick cortex exceeds most known Neanderthal ranges, hinting that his lineage may have persisted under especially harsh conditions. The shape of the shaft, strongly compressed medialaterally, resembles examples from Shanidar but exaggerates them enough to stand apart. 
This suggests a population with strong directional stresses, or alternatively, a physiological regime with sustained high androgen exposure. Either possibility implies a life lived under extreme physical demands, whether imposed by climate, subsistence, or both. The date range tentatively assigned to the Kowalinsk individual places him firmly in the middle Pleistocene. This period, from roughly 200,000 to 130,000 years ago, saw repeated glacial pulses that drove Eurasian ecosystems into waves of contraction and expansion. Neanderthals in Western Europe developed recognizably specialized morphologies during this time, and comparable populations appear across the Caucasus and into the Urals. The archaeological record in the Middle Volga contains stone industries compatible with Middle Paleolithic occupation, though no tools were recovered directly with the bones. The absence of cultural material near the fine spot probably reflects the accidental nature of the discovery, rather than an isolated burial. The riverbank context may have washed away associated sediments. Museums are places of memory and amnesia, and the history of the Kavalinsk remains demonstrates this. After their initial recovery, they passed into the Pavlov collection. Mid-century scholars described the skull, including its archaic features, in several Soviet publications. The Calvaria then disappeared from view. By the early 21st century, only the humerus could be located, and even it had been mislabeled and effectively forgotten. Its rediscovery allowed detailed osteological study, but the skull, which would have confirmed or clarified the individual's position among Neanderthals or Denisovans, was nowhere to be found. It may still exist, misplaced in a regional museum, a university cabinet, or a mislabeled crate. The Volga Neanderthal reflects a deep time when Eurasian hominin networks were more expansive than once assumed. Neanderthals were not confined to the famous caves of Western Europe. They moved east, reaching the Altai. Denisovans moved west, leaving traces in mitochondrial signatures. In the Crimean specimen whose mitochondrial genome resembles those from the Altai, one sees the imprint of long-distance contact. The Volga individual fits squarely into this broader story, a node along a transcontinental corridor. The 55 degrees north latitude ecological belt offered game, migratory access, and seasonal movement. The Middle Volga held strategic advantage as an interchange zone, channeling animals through the valley and offering hominins a reliable setting for subsistence. In this light, the peculiarities of the Kavalinsk humerus seem less anomalous. They may mark a lineage conditioned by repeated exposure to harsh cold and reliant on close-range hunting. The unusual hormonal pattern may be a biological reflection of this selective pressure. Perhaps his group carried ancient genetic signals approaching the frontier between Neanderthals and Denisovans. Ultimately, a missing bone shapes the narrative. The humerus stands silent but eloquent, while the skullcap would have spoken more clearly. With it, ancient DNA might have been obtained, anchoring this individual within or near the Altai Neanderthal population. Without it, the argument rests on context, anatomy, and comparison. Yet even these point in a consistent direction, toward an eastern Neanderthal existing early in their expansion, with features adapted to the Middle Volga, and possibly influenced by populations nearer to Siberia. The Kowalinsk individual reveals that the eastern Neanderthal world was not peripheral. Instead, the Volga region formed a living artery in the geography of ancient humans. For reasons unknown, his bones ended up in the soil of Koroshkovsky Island, only to be found and forgotten. His skull is still missing. His arm remains. From it, we glimpse a life lived in wind, cold and tension, with muscles that left marks in stone-hard bone. We imagine a Neanderthal hunter, his physiology tuned to the demands of his world, perhaps carrying a genetic legacy from populations that ranged towards Siberia. That legacy may later reappear in Crimea, where the mitochondrial imprint of the Altai has been found. Nothing about this story is straightforward, yet it hints that the Neanderthal range and their genetic and cultural web were far more extensive than once assumed. If the missing Calvaria is ever found, it may confirm this eastern link decisively, perhaps even revealing genomic evidence of Denisovan ties. Until then, 
the Volga Neanderthal remains a remarkable solitary witness, preserved by chance and recovered only through the diligence of curators eight decades after his bones were first lifted from the riverbank. His story is a reminder that the human past is fragile, dispersed, and occasionally rediscovered in the quiet drawers of museums. Thanks for watching.